All right, this week in Sustainable Construction, we'll be covering green building rating systems. In the United States, prior to 1998, we didn't really have a way of measuring uh, the greenness, if you will, of a, a standard design or a building. So um, up until then, we didn't really have any rating system. People were building, uh, trying to build green things, energy efficient buildings uh, with alternative materials, but there was no sort of measurement system. So no specific criteria. Uh, designers mostly operated on assumption materials and designs had green attributes uh, but again there's no measuring stick and uh, debatably you know this has and hasn't changed the the implementation of some green building rating systems has been extremely helpful in the marketplace and yet we still have some of the same problems we had prior to 1988 1998 excuse me there are quite a few green building assessment uh, systems in the United States. We have LEED. Um, we also have other ones in the United States, for example, Green Globes, uh, came, which is actually a little farther down this list, uh, came online in 2004 and has since been implemented in the United States also. LEED Canada uh, has its own uh, version of the LEED standard. I believe they're not, they're sister organizations. The standards are very similar, but they're not obviously the same country so and not only that but you build a little bit differently in Canada than you do in most of the United States so for that matter uh, its own standard is appropriate. BREEAM is a British standard, uh, CASB is from Japan, Green Star is uh, an Australian rating system, GB Tool is kind of an, uh, from an international uh, perspective I've used that rating system once it's had a, back in, I think, uh, 2003, had a lot of considerations that some of the other rating systems did not. The FGBC, Florida Green Building Council, still has a local standard. If you're building residential in the state of Florida, I would recommend that one. It's a very comprehensive standard. It has a lot of different points, a lot of different considerations for improving or actually reducing the environmental impact of, of the building. Energy Star for buildings. Um, think everybody's seen those stickers on appliances there's another certification method for buildings generally speaking you get that through the home energy rating system which is listed down at the bottom more recently the living building challenge this is probably the most stringent building rating system out there today uh, there's an emphasis on net zero so net zero power net zero water uh, I believe you're even supposed to grow your own food for the living building challenge um, it's a it's a very stringent standard. I think we talked about passive houses briefly in um, the energy section or energy module in this course. Passive house is a very stringent energy standard uh, and you can certify a building under passive house. You can also get a net zero energy building. Uh, again, that's got to be part of the living building challenge, but you could identify, there's no real uh, specification or certification rather that identifies a building as net zero other than you doing the math and, and showing it. So there's no plaque that you get to hold or, you know, mount in the lobby, for example. Green Globes was originally a Canadian system. It's since become a competitor to lead. Um, it was first implemented in 2004 and only recently did it become available in the United States. Another uh, residential rating system is the HERS rating system or Home Energy Rating System that involves comprehensive evaluations of appliances, heating, ventilation and air conditioning equipment, uh, building envelope, windows, um, everything and actually that kind of fits into the energy star criteria you can get those evaluations done locally you do need to contact the local energy auditor all right so we've talked about this uh, quite a bit before <laughs> there's not really a good way of and the problem with building assessment systems is not really a universal way of measuring environmental impact so we can measure it at the local regional national or global scale we can measure it in mass energy volume or parts per million um, most building assessment systems have com common elements but there's some discord on how to measure the different scales of impact and lead is actually a perfect example of this is you get water efficiency credits in lead 
regardless of the climate. We do have things like regional priorities in LEED, uh, which allow you to get more points, say for example, if you're doing water conservation in a dry desert climate, but there's a lot of um, discord in, in how things are built locally versus over the United States. It's not really appropriate to give a single measuring stick for the United States when everybody builds locally and the codes change from climate to climate. LEED used to be a single standard. It's since become a suite of 16. I don't think this is an exhaustive list, but um, LEED now certifies existing buildings. It certifies commercial interiors project. So just the interior of the, uh, the building, if you're just doing a renovation of carpet, paint, furniture, things of that nature, that would apply to commercial interiors. Core and shell is when somebody would develop a commercial building, uh, say for example, for an occupant like Starbucks. Starbucks has all their standard wallpaper tile, lamps, things like that. So they're just really developing the core and shell and nothing with the interior finishes. LEED even has a home certification. They've stretched, expanded it to neighborhood development now. So um, they're trying to focus beyond uh, the building. They've got LEED for schools, for retail, and for healthcare. And each one of those has some different variation with respect to the standard. Uh, each of those reference guides, I will add, uh, costs the same amount, and you have to purchase each one of them. So. Um, do the math if you if you look at what one of those reference guides costs they're not exactly inexpensive and to to get a whole volume of them they update every so often um, it's not inexpensive so criticisms of the lead standard um, a lot of people especially for people you know like me who have done a fair amount of research on green building uh, there is some lacking in the scientific robustness of the uh, the weighting system, the standard, what you get points for and what you don't. Uh, it is weighted inequitably, meaning that um, there is an emphasis on energy efficiency in LEED, and that is to the detriment of things like water conservation, site uh, orientation, things like that. So uh, a lot of people complain that there's a, a focus or you know, an overemphasis rather on some of the criteria and not others. There's no mess mention of persistent organic pollutants, so again, getting back into scientific robustness or rigor, uh, there are certain things in the environment that we would like to see addressed, and, and LEED simply glosses some of those over. The last one is cost, and um, it used to be that LEED was reasonable. We would talk about the premium you would have to pay for some of the materials and some of the energy efficient equipment. We used to be able to argue that um, that would pay off over time and more recently everybody's kind of you know come on board with that so a lot of people want a lead standard building but they don't want to have to pay for the administrative costs and they don't want to have to pay for just the plaque on the wall a lot of people have accomplished lead at this point um, there are a lot of administrative fees there's a lot of paperwork there's additional cost uh, with executing uh, a lead project and a lot of people are not specifically interested in, in incurring those costs. This is a checklist of the lead version 4 uh, building design and construction new design or new construction and major renovation uh, standard. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, main areas of um, Credits. There's also regional priority, and that's to address differences in uh, climate or building specific area like ge geography. Um, the first category, location and transportation, um, lead promotes um, basically urban infill and higher density construction. So um, they de-emphasize sensitive land, conservation land. They want you to build where there are, there's already infrastructure and transportation facilities. Sustainable sites, uh, that talks about air pollution, um, rainwater management. I think we've talked about heat island in the water conservation module. There's also a credit for light pollution in there. So um, anybody who's not familiar with light pollution, if you ever took like general astronomy as an elective, um, if you if you get a telescope in an inner city uh, where you have a lot of light pollution it's really hard to see the stars if you go out in the country 
and anybody who's been out in the remote desert. Um, I think the, the clearest night sky I ever saw was in south of Chile and there it just looks like the stars are on top of you and not only are there a few stars there are just billions of them you can see galaxies with the naked eye so late light pollution uh, for the purposes of lead I don't think it's for astronomers necessarily but more for uh, wildlife so certain types of wildlife don't like the light water conservation um, you get 11 points or 11 credits for uh, different ways of reducing water consumption and here's where the inequitable distribution comes in for water you get 11 credits energy and atmosphere they've got a total of 33 so there definitely is an emphasis on um, energy uh, efficiency and I'm not trying to underscore the importance of that but it's not necessarily a fair weighting so to make the building efficient uh, you get a lot of points for that you do get some credit also for materials and resources with type you know material sourcing are they locally sourced are they post uh, consumer recycled post industrial recycled content um, we are also looking the thing we looked at with materials last week with the environmental product declarations that all ties into the materials and resources rating system component of lead there are other credits available for indoor environmental quality so we used to build buildings super tight without much regard to what was in there usually there used to be about four credits available for low emitting materials um, paints carpet adhesives sealants things of that nature uh, they they all had a very high voc content you actually smell that stuff uh, now just a, nowadays just about everybody has kind of come on board with uh, the low voc thing so one of the successful market transformations for lead was exactly that that um, they got rid of or they made the materials better basically you do get project or points for innovation. Uh, that's usually supposed to be something that nobody's ever done before, uh, which is getting harder and harder. And then you also got credits for regional priority. The reason I'm spending a lot of time on this slide is because this is very much the blueprint for almost every other um, blue, a green building rating system. The exceptions might be green globes, where they actually talk about integrated design, which is including the whole design team in the build. Um, so there's things in other rating systems that aren't in lead, but as a general blueprint, this is this is some of the main criteria that we look for in evaluating a green building. LEED has been responsible for uh, market transportation uh, transformation. There's there's no denying it. They do uh, encourage stakeholder participation. So the other thing that's been good about it is the owners have become a lot more educated about this stuff too, and ultimately that's who who uh, decides the performance. Um, the downside, I think we've kind of mentioned this. 
Uh, a lot of people feel that the lead standard is biased towards certain industry interests. For example, mechanical engineering. There's a lot of stuff about ASHRAE in there. Um, there's not as much stuff, comparatively speaking, uh, about passive ventilation, which, you know, from an energy efficiency standpoint, that's probably a favorable outcome. Um, a lot of people talk about everybody gets a piece of the pie in lead, and there are a number of certification systems or reference guide that are mentioned throughout. Um, they're all sort of incorporated by reference into LEED. So um, I have attached a link here of the certification and guide and fees. LEED has been responsible for uh, quite a, deal, a great deal of uh, market transformation. In fact, that it was it was main its main intent in the beginning was market transformation. Uh, we encouraged uh, stakeholder buy-in. Uh, ultimately, you know, the stakeholders are the one that own the building anyways, so uh, a lot of that was kind of based on the idea that, you know, the owners would have a more satisfactory outcome with the building. A lot of people feel that uh, the LEED standard is, however, uh, biased towards certain industry interests, uh, specifically mechanical engineering. There's a lot of stuff about ASHRAE in there. There's an emphasis on mechanical uh, HVAC design as opposed to passive design. There's a lot of reference guides that are incorporated by reference into the LEED standard and everybody uh, basically gets a piece of the pie. There is a link here with the certification guide and the fees associated with LEED. Again, uh, it, not to be too cynical about it, but one of the main criticisms of LEED is its cost. If you take a less cynical look at green building rating systems they can be used as a template to build truly uh, phenomenal buildings I have incorporated uh, a couple videos of the bullet center here uh, it's a building in downtown Seattle it was a lead platinum building when it opened I believe it's also uh, a net zero uh, building based on and actually the you look at the roof of the building it's a little bit weird looking uh, it's the building was actually uh, built to or, or excuse me the roof was actually built to accommodate a greater area of solar panels they had to get a variance with the city to do that so it's a little odd looking building but the the roof has a purpose and that's to be able to track uh, convert rather sufficient uh, sunlight to electricity this is the Audubon Center outside of Los Angeles I believe this was certified around late 90s early 2000s this was one of the first lead platinum buildings uh, it's 10 minutes from downtown LA it's only a 5,000 square foot building uh, some of its partially enclosed the cost of this uh, was five million dollars so back in the day that was uh, 371 dollars per square foot it's pretty expensive um, state-of-the-art stuff this one is off-grid it's got three solar systems. Uh, it's got a PV array with 208 panels with battery backup. It's got a glass vacuum tube solar collector that provide high temperature water and solar uh, powered chiller for air conditioning and a solar hot water system. So a lot of little gadgets on this building. Um, what else does this have? There's actually one of the favorite features I have on here. You used to get credits in LEED for the operability of systems, including windows. And a lot of buildings, a lot of office buildings, simply moved away from that uh, with enclosed windows uh, and air conditioning. So you do have the opportunity of operating windows in this building. They had some uh, water conservation features and they also had ceiling fans. We don't often think of ceiling fans as a energy conservation method but um, they do circulate air. Circulation is one of the criteria for occupant comfort so not just temperature and humidity but circulation. Um, if you are looking away to, for a way to feel more comfortable in the summertime you can basically uh, raise the temperature of your AC unit and put a ceiling fan on and the ceiling fan uses a uh, far lesser amount of electricity than a condensing unit does so uh, all told you could leave the ceiling fan all day and and reduce your cooling bill one of the things that has come online recently is the low velocity high volume fan family uh, there is a brand 
uh, called Big Ass Fans. It's got a picture of a donkey on it, so I'm um, not trying to be crude, but these, uh, they move very slowly, low velocity, and they move a very high volume of air. So um, this feature right here, particularly in a warehouse setting where you have, you know, sometimes in a, in a building like this, the air will stratify with the cool air down by the floor and the hottest air up by the roof deck. If you're able to circulate the air, it brings some of that coolest air off of the floor. And uh, again, it's more about occupant comfort necessarily than it is about temperature. What else did the Audubon Center have? Uh, this was kind of ahead of its time, I want to say, at least in the United States. They had gray water and black water recycling. Uh, they had wastewater treated on site using filters and organisms. So basically, that was the mechanism for, for the gray water and black water recycling. Um, they captured a lot of stormwater on site. And actually, I think we, on our module on water, we looked at the effects of developed land on, on runoff and such. And uh, there's been a lot of movement in green construction to sort of capture that on site. 97% of the construction waste was recycled. Sounds quite remarkable. Uh, I think I referenced the Dutch standard uh, a couple modules ago, and that's basically 100% for every building. So the Audubon Center accomplished really what a uh, run of the mill uh, Dutch building accomplished. Landscape designed with native and adapted species, drought tolerant, fire resistant. Los Angeles, uh, I think you've seen on the news recently that California has been having problems with fires. Uh, there is a way to landscape in California for water conservation. In fact, it's all more important. They were going through extreme drought a couple years back. Um, and actually cities were incentivizing the planting or the replanting of gardens and landscapes uh, with drought tolerant species. So. Uh, this was probably at the time a little bit of a newer concept nowadays if you say xeriscape and just about everybody knows what you're talking about what else materials they use some innovative materials um, with it you know they're claiming stuff like steel rebar with 97 percent recycled content it's not all that innovative of um, uh, a technology or a material um, especially the cast in place concrete with 25% fly ash that's pretty standard nowadays um, synthetic gypsum FC FSC certified wood these are all things that um, back in the day were a little bit more innovative than they are now now just about every material uh, contains those things I think the one second from the bottom is maybe the most in innovative is medium density fiberboard made with wheat and sunflower composites um, I guarantee that's a lot more expensive than the MDF that you would buy uh, made from conventional materials. So the preceding slide was the cooperative groups corporate headquarters. Uh, headquarters. This is in England. Um, I've tried to incorporate some of the most innovative um, technologies and some of the best buildings like state-of-the-art buildings so when we talk about green building rating systems really what we're trying to encourage is the state-of-the-art and this this building is uh, quite a good example it's got two uh, a two skin facade for example and that I'm, I'll let you read through all of the technologies here so that this PowerPoint doesn't go on forever but one of the most uh, amazing features of this building if you ask me is the twin skin facade and really what you have there is two layers of glass uh, with a big air barrier in between. Air is probably one of the best insulators there is. You probably get a little bit of ventilation in between those two layers right there, but it can act as a, a, a solar heat gain when you want it to and a, a way of rejecting solar heat when you don't want it to. Depending on the climate, of course, depending on the orientation, I will say that having two uh, layers of glass on a single building um, does cost a little bit extra money. Um, the argument would be that if I spend more money on the facade and the envelope, the less money I'd have to spend on, on the uh, mechanical equipment. But overall, please read through the, the remainder of it. I, the technologies are pretty remarkable. They are able to um, do some pretty remarkable things with buildings.
so the preceding house was the powerhouse in Norway. Um, what they're doing is trying to seek net zero energy over the course of the building's proposed 60 year life. Uh, this also includes the embodied energy of the materials and this is actually something that no other rating system or no rating system really addresses. Um, when we talk about the embodied energy of materials, we talked about that briefly during the materials module where in the manufacture, the extraction, the transportation of a certain material, there's a whole bunch of energy and environmental impact that goes into just getting a material to the job site before it can even be used. That's what we refer to as embodied energy. So this house is trying to not only go net zero, but to work effectively on net negative uh, zero energy to the point where they can uh, make up for those uh, embodied energies that were used to produce uh, the materials. House does include geothermal and solar panels also. Those are not necessarily uh, innovative technologies, but they are doing things. I mean, you'd have to do everything possible to get into the ne negative zero energy. How do you measure a green building? I think we've talked about this before. Uh, single measurement is not possible. So the same rule applies to buildings as applies to materials. Environmental impact is measured in many different ways and you can employ many different units of measurement. This is the stuff we looked at during life cycle assessment. So again, I could evaluate a building as well as a building material by any of these criteria right here. And when there's not really a building that satisfies all of these, and there's no material that satisfies all these, unless you don't build the building material or the building. So really what we're looking at when we're talking about sustainable construction is the reduction of impacts across the spectrum, meaning each and every one of these categories. What are the steps toward LEED certification? These are very similar to uh, some of the other um, green building rating systems. First step is can the building be certified? Uh, you do a quick feasibility study. Um, we have in the past in this class done feasibility studies of building 70 other buildings on campus. Uh, if you can determine that sufficient credits are achievable then you would register the project with the um, USGBC. You would also need to make sure that the building meets all the prerequisites. Prerequisites are different from the credits. There are certain criteria that LEED says are non-negotiable. Those are what we refer to as prerequisites. Uh, you would have to document, obviously, uh, how the, the project was built, how it was designed to achieve a certain number of the credits. Uh, you do need to submit these uh, documents online. There is a mechanism for appealing points if LEED says, no, you don't get that one or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, ultimately, you'll receive some kind of final notification from the U.S. Green Building Council says you either uh, got certified or not, or you got silver, gold, or platinum. Uh, basically, the approach is fully online now. There are credit interpretation reports that you can. Um, I think you get a couple for free, but then beyond that, yeah, you got to pay $220 a pop. Uh, sometimes the descriptions that are given in some of the the criteria or the credits are not altogether clear. Sometimes you encounter unique scenarios and that requires sometimes that you ask a question of lead. Now they charge you $220 to do so. Um, it's, we'll, we'll leave that open for debate as to whether that's a, a good thing or a bad thing. Lead certification can be appealed. I know, for example, in the uh, Rinker Hall, where the UF School of Building Construction is located, they initially awarded that a silver rating. They missed the points by, I think, one. Uh, the builders ended up appealing one of the credits, and it was overturned, and the building was rated gold after that. So you can appeal the points. Uh, it can be based on interpretation, errors and omissions, or failure to achieve a desired credit. So all those things are applicable. Uh, points. So the allocation of points to each category is arbitrary. It's based solely on the judgment of the developers. I think we've gone over some of this stuff already. Um, some of these links actually work and some of them don't. Um, I think the points actually in, in this slide are, are not as current as the one in version 4. These are from a previous uh, um, version of LEED. But if you look at those of like energy efficiency versus water consumption versus sustainable sites, 
um, it's all very up in the air and it's not equitable. So in 2004, uh, the Green Building Initiative acquired the rights to distribute green globes in the United States. It is an ANSI rated standard. Um, the criteria are a little different. Um, they've got criteria for planning, durability, adaptability, life cycle assessment, and noise control. Um, they've also got things for project management and um, emergency uh, response. So it does address a lot of the stuff that the LEED standard does, but it's got all this other stuff in there that LEED does not. So um, arguably, some people think this is a better standard. Uh, the fact that LEED now has a competitor can't be uh, a bad thing at all. So how does it work? You have to decide whether you're eligible for green globes. You would have to be able to achieve or attain 35% um, of the credits. A third party verifier uh, needs to inspect the building. So actually somebody comes out to the site and verifies this. Um, one, they re review the plans before the project is built and then they come out afterwards and inspect the building. Total number of points is adjusted depending on the project's location uh, and actual end uh, performance. So I th again, I think most of these links work, um, but to go check the, the reference standard, see how it works, just a little bit different than LEED. BREAM also gives you credit for management. Uh, again, these are all very similar to what we were looking at before with the LEED standard in terms of a basic template. There is a video here, you might want to take a look at that for some perspective. Uh, but again, the, the, the criteria are very much the same, just kind of maybe named a little bit differently. Sometimes they award points differently, um, but a lot of rating systems focus on the same thing. CASB in Japan, again, energy, resources and material, quality of service, indoor environment, all these things are, are vert, you know, almost generally common to, to all these rating systems. Green Star, effectively the same thing. Materials, emissions, water, energy, transportation, these are all common threads for different green building rating systems. GB Tool, I would say, is also the same thing. So environmental loadings might be a little bit different than talking about energy efficiency. Effectively, the, the standards work the same. They award points a little differently. The criteria, generally speaking, are the same. I would like you to look at the Florida Green Building Coalition standard. To me, uh, for residents in the state of Florida, this is by far the most comprehensive standard. It's a great way of building. It's a great thing to think about. Uh, I actually had a student who did a project uh, based on this standard, and uh, after he got involved with it for about a month or so, he said it was by far more stringent than anything Lee might have to offer. So, good one to check out. Uh, definitely local. All right, so we can talk about, you know, different project deliveries. I think here it is relevant to the green building delivery process. Um, there are advantages of design, bid, build versus const uh, construction manager at risk. Um, the one thing that you want to shoot for in all of these green building rating systems is integrated design. And that's basically where everybody, the design team, the build team, are all sitting around the same table talking about how to make the most optimal building. Again, these are all things that we're probably more used to. I'm, I'm not going to cover these. These are more like um, what we would discuss in construction administration, for example. Just understand that there are different delivery methods, different contract methods. Um, and these do have an impact on how the building is designed and how it's built. And that affects green building uh, a lot of the time. So a lot of these way, things uh, you just need to look at, you know, what the, the different nuances of these, these contract or delivery methods might be and see which one might be the best for a green building project. High performance buildings, for example, so lead green buildings. Um, you do have additional responsibility of the project team. It does require better communications. It does require special communications. Um, LEAD, for example, requires strong familiarity with the, the process. Um, and you should have experience with the charrette process. So there's another slide later on about what that is. 
Um, it's basically a group meeting, interchange of ideas where everybody really is sitting on the, the same table. Everybody's working on the same sheet of music. There also needs to be transparency among team members. I need the HVAC or mechanical engineer needs to know what the structural engineer is doing versus what the controls engineer is doing versus the finishes even. So all those people need to sit down and on the on the same table and, and work together. And really that's the gist of integrated design. I won't read the slide because it'll take me forever to do so. The, you do get points for integrated design in G, uh, excuse me green globes. So one of the things that LEED does not require is integrated design. Some of the other rating systems do require this, that everybody sits down and gets on the same uh, page. And a design charrette is actually an instrument for that. It's creating a, basically um, involving all the stakeholders and having a meeting and basically involving everybody from the start, um, collaborating, having meetings, everybody working on the same page. What's the role of the LEED AP? You used to get a credit in the LEED standard for uh, just having an AP on, on site. Nowadays you have two levels or actually multiple different levels of certification. I was actually one of the original LEED APs I think back in uh, 2003. Uh, that's before they started certifying for LEED BDNC, LEED existing buildings. Uh, there's a bunch of different specializations you can get now and it all requires continuing education. The lowest credential you can get now is a LEED Green Associate. Uh, that's a general introduction to how LEED works. From there you would get a specialty um, sort of uh, accreditation like LEED B and D for example, uh, B, D and C for example. It does provide you with a certain amount of insight and familiarity with the set standard. So it's been a while since I've worked on any lead projects. I would say I'm less familiar with the process now than I ever have been. But I can tell you firsthand from wor having worked on lead projects before, having a background and understanding, actually having the credential can't hurt you either, but having a background in green building with specific training in one of those standards uh, is crucial if you help hope to navigate uh, the delivery of a project like that. We talk about value engineering and estimating and engineering economy and uh, a lot of other uh, classes around here. You do need to uh, take care of the, to make sure that certain design features are not eliminated through the value engineering process, uh, especially energy efficient uh, stuff. So I, I know I said that the, the rating system should be more equitable and there was too much emphasis on energy efficiency, but don't be afraid to spend money up front. In life cycle thinking, uh, the, the concept is that those investments will pay off over time. In value engineering, sometimes we think about just reducing the upfront cost without thinking necessarily through the life cycle. So all those things need to be thought through 